Please stand for the call to worship. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 46. The passage reads, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Praise the Lord and praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near and praise Him in glad adoration. The Lord who was wondrously, wondrously reigned, shelters thee under his wings and so gently sustained it. And hast thou not seen how thy desires there have been, and granted in what he ordained? Prosper thy work in defending. Surely his goodness and mercy shall daily attend thee. And ponder anew what the Almighty can do. And did with his love he befriend and breath come now with praises before him and let the amen sound from his people again and gladly forever adore him and let the amen sound from his people again and gladly forever 
Father, I adore Him. It's in Jesus. In Jesus, Jesus. How I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. And Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Sing together, tis so sweet. And it is so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word and just to rest upon his promise and to know the saith the Lord. Oh, how sweet. And oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, and just to trust His cleansing blood, and in simple faith to plunge me and need the healing cleanse. Let's sing, Jesus, and Jesus, Jesus, how. Is sweet. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and
precious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love Thee because I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary Street. And I to us. Lord, everything else that we think love is, is just a cheap imitation of what you have shown us on the cross. Lord, help us to gaze, help us to fix our eyes on what true love is, Lord, that you are love. On how we falter and fail so many times, time and time and time again, even in this past week. But Lord, we thank you for being a God who is compassionate and merciful. Lord, you meet us where we are at. Lord, you, you gave food to people who you knew one day would cry to make make him our king and not even a week after Lord to say that, that, that they want to crucify him and Lord when we sin and we turn away from you Lord we are doing the exact same thing we are choosing the pleasures of the world instead of choosing you but Lord we thank you for being a God again who is merciful and compassionate and meets us where we are at Lord as we, as we sing as we hear your word Lord would it pierce our hearts would it not just be words that we hear and we, and we go away unchanged, but that we would come face to face with you and to know you more and to love you more and to cherish you more. So thank you for this time of seeing. Open our ears and our hearts and our eyes to be able to receive your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Good morning. 
<clears throat> it, it, this morning, it, it's, a, it's a blessing for us to celebrate as a church family, Palm Sunday, a blessed day for us as believers that launches us, us into Holy Week, uh, the week where we commemorate Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, this morning, if you've, if you've been with us, we've been marching through the Gospel of John. And for this Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter, what we're going to do is kind of put our finger where we're at in John chapter 4. And this morning, we're going to fast forward a little bit. We're going to fast forward three years in the life of Jesus Christ. And then after Good Friday and Easter, we're going to come back to John chapter 4. Okay? So this morning, we're going to jump forward to John chapter 12 for Palm Sunday. John chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. Six days before the Passover... Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. This says six days before the Passover. This is the Passover. This is going to be the final Passover. Whereas the Jews go to Jerusalem once a year to sacrifice lambs for their sins, Jesus will be dying on the cross for the sins of the world. This is the final Passover. And we know that the Jews, the, how they commemorated the Passover, it was looking back at what God did in the Old Testament through the leadership of Moses when they're in slavery to Egypt, how God had them slaughter a sacrificial lamb, put the blood over the doorpost, and so when the death angel came, he would pass over the families that were covered by the blood of the lamb and kill the firstborn of those who were not. And those who were covered by the lamb were spared. And here we have Jesus Christ and the final Passover will be the sacrificial lamb saving everyone covered by his blood by grace through faith for all eternity. Six days before that Passover. Six days before the nails. Six days before the crown of thorns. Six days before the spitting and the mocking and the punching. Six days before the whipping. Six days before the nails on the cross and the spear in the side. Six days He's dead, and he knows it. So this is six days before the Passover. If this is Sunday morning, good uh, Palm Sunday, in our story, this would have been yesterday. This would have been Saturday. And just to give us a little bit of context, John chapter 11, just prior to this, we'll get there eventually in our study of John, but Jesus was ministering. And his good friends, Mary and Martha, come to him, and they say, Jesus, our brother and your friend Lazarus, He's sick and he's dying. Jesus says, okay. And by the time he gets to Bethany where they lived, Lazarus is dead and he's in the tomb. And what marks the peak culminating capstone miracle of Jesus' ministry, he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out of the grave alive. That is the peak miracle and that is also the straw that will break the camel's back. In terms of the Pharisees and the scribes, they will say, okay, that's it. You have such a large following after that miracle, we want you dead. And they put out an arrest warrant for him. They said, we are going to ambush you wherever you go. You're probably going to come to Jerusalem for the Passover, and you're gone. The arrest warrant is out. And in John chapter 11, it says he couldn't even walk around publicly anymore. And so he goes to the outskirts of town. And here in John chapter 12, verse 1, It says six days before the Passover, he comes back to Bethany. He comes back. This is just a couple miles away from Jerusalem. And this is where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. This was his home away from home. And so what is essentially happening is Jesus is making his way back to Jerusalem. This is the danger zone. This is where he knows he will be arrested. Everyone's looking for him. And why was he there? Verse 2. Why do you come back into danger, Jesus? Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Why did he come back to Bethany when everyone wants him? Mary and Martha were throwing a dinner party for him. Why? What's the occasion? Just days ago, they saw their brother walk out of the grave. That's why. And Jesus is the guest of honor. And so they're throwing a celebration with friends, family, maybe 20 plus people just to honor him and to thank him. And we see Martha, we saw it in Luke 10. She's doing what her gifts allow her to do and she's just serving. That's that's usually what we see Martha doing. And it's funny because Lazarus is just there eating. He's just there at the table. It was a low table. You, You laid on the ground and you ate for a long time. And he's just eating. He came out of the grave just days ago. 
I mean, what, what do you ask a guy who came out of the grave? How do you feel? You know, how, how do you dress? I don't, I've never been to a resurrection party. You know, what do you bring? We, we bring desserts. We bring something from Tokyo Central. What do we bring to a resurrection party? I don't know. But they're in the middle of this dinner, and it says in verse 3, then Mary, Lazarus and Martha's sister, she gets up. She took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. To John the author, time stood still right here. Here we have, we're in the middle of, of dinner, and Mary gets up, she breaks rank, and she gets up and she grabs a pint of pure mart, nard. This is expensive, expensive perfume. It was extracted from the root of a nard plant that was found in the Himalayas in India and had to be imported by foot. And here it says she has a pint of it. The word there in the Greek is it's litra. It's a Roman pound. It's about 12 ounces. So if you imagine a Coke can, she has that much of this expensive nard. Matthew 26 and Mark 14 says she has it in an alabaster jar. That's, that's how precious it is. And in a few minutes, we're going to see Judas say that, that that's worth about 300 denarii. That, that's worth about a year's wages. So if you take California, just say, and we take minimum wage, a year's wages, that puts you at about thirty to $40,000 for this perfume, at least. This is expensive, expensive perfume. And we don't know how Mary came to have this. Maybe she was wealthy, we don't know. Probably it was a family heirloom that was passed down from generation to generation. And if so, it was probably very sentimental to her. What's implied is it was the most expensive and precious thing that she had in her possession. And it probably served as a nest egg as well. Where if things in her family were to go south, she could sell that and have something to sit on. This was her security blanket. And, and this type of perfume, this type of expensive perfume, was only used on special occasions, like weddings, dinners, and funerals. Because back then, they didn't really bathe. Instead of removing the body odors, what they would do was cover it with fragrances. And for funerals, they would use it to cover the scent of a decaying body. And so picture this, at dinner, Mary just gets up and she takes this expensive oil and just dumps it all at his feet, it says. In, in Mark's account, Mark 14, it says she broke the jar. So she didn't just pop the top, pour some out, little dab, little dab. She broke it open and poured it all out. There's no going back here. I, I can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. It's, it's out. There, there's no regrets here. I, I'm, there's nothing better I am saving it for in the future. This is it. And here in John chapter 12, verse 3, it says she gets up, not only that, pours it out. In the Matthew and Mark account, it says she, she poured it on his head. So it probably started on, on Jesus' head and rolled down to his feet. That's how much liquid there was. And John says she takes her hair, which was probably tied up, and she lets it down, and she starts to wipe his dirty feet with her hair. T time is standing still. And this is probably foreign to us, but what's going on here is completely disgraceful. This is completely shocking. Culturally and socially, this was a big no-no. You just, a woman didn't do something like this. It was completely inappropriate. And especially back then, a woman's hair was a symbol of her dignity. It was a symbol of her beauty. It was a symbol of her value as a woman. And they didn't usually let it down. They only let it down in front of their, their, her husband or immediate family members. And here she lets it down in front of the entire dinner party and uses it to wipe Jesus' dirty, grimy feet. Not even using a towel. She uses her hair. And in essence, what she is saying, by using this perfume, by using her hair, is the best of me is lower than the lowest part of you. That is worship. That, that is worship. That is what we are to see in this, that she is honoring Jesus with the most valuable thing that she had, perfume, and, and the greatest part of her symbolized in her hair 
That is worship in its rawest, most purest form. In my opinion, there is no greater picture of worship in Scripture than to take all that you have and all that you are and pour it out at the feet of Jesus. She wasn't worshiping in just words, but she was pouring it out. And what she was doing was completely shocking. But for Mary, out of love for Jesus Christ, I love you so much, nobody else was in that room for her than her and her loving Savior. That is what undivided worship should look like for us. There is nobody here but me and the Savior that I'm over the top in love with. And she just gets completely lost in it. And she pours it all out. That's what undivided worship is. Thirty to forty thousand dollars gone in an instant. His hair and his clothes probably couldn't even absorb it all. But a lot of it probably ran out onto the ground. Thirty to forty thousand dollars gone in an instant. This is not a uh, I gotta go to church, but I'm so tired type of moment. This is not, do I have to read my Bible today? I did it yesterday type of moment. This is not, Brad, when's your sermon gonna be over? I'm hungry type of moment. This is not, what is the minimum amount I can do and still be considered a Christian type of moment? Jesus, you ask too much. This isn't a I have to type of moment. And we all know that's not what we should be saying every Sunday morning. That's not worship and we know it. Being enthralled with, over the top, in love with Jesus Christ, with all that I am and all that I have, that is worship in its purest, rawest form. Now what I'm not saying is that in order to worship Jesus, you need to go home and just throw everything away. That is not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, to take everything that we have and everything we own and put it low at the feet of Jesus in terms of money, in terms of energy, in terms of what we treasure, in terms of what we find satisfaction in, in terms of what we find security in, in terms of what we find joy in, in terms of what we find peace and hope in. That is undivided worship. Do we have that? But in order to get a better picture of what worship should look like, we need to get a picture of what worship does not look like. Look at verse 4. This is what worship does not look like. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Maybe not a bad argument. It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. And so here we got Mary breaking the mold, getting up during dinner, and just pouring out this expensive perfume and wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. And all, G all Judas is thinking, and he's completely horrified, he's completely disgusted, and he's saying, Mary, what in the world are you doing? Get up. That is completely inappropriate. He's utterly disgusted. What a complete waste. We could have taken this, all this money and given it to the poor. You could have sold it. This is a waste. And in her mind, what Judas is saying that she's doing is she went out, bought a brand new car, drove it off the lot, and drove it straight off a cliff on purpose. And John exposes the motive of Judas. And he says he didn't really care about the poor. He's, Judas was the designated treasurer for the disciples for three years in his ministry. He was in charge of the money bag. And what it says he would do was just skim off the top. I do think that Judas started out thinking, this guy is the Messiah. But he followed him thinking, he's going to be the Messiah and the king one day. I need to be his disciple so that I could get from it. And as time went on and he started to see that Jesus wasn't this ruler that he claimed to be, he can't possibly be the Messiah. I'm going to get what I can while I'm here. And so he would just embezzle money for three years. And he's looking for a way out. And right after this, that night, he's going to go out and sell him for less. About $1,000, 30 pieces of silver. 
If you're not going to give me what I want, Jesus, I am going to take it. And so she's look, Judas is looking at Mary, and all he sees is money disappearing out of his wallet. Oh, the things I could buy with that money, right? If you ever thought about winning the lotto, the things you would buy, that's all he's thinking of. Oh, and just seeing it disappear in front of him. In his mind, he is upset with Mary as if she is stealing directly from him. Stealing money directly from him. And he covers it with false righteousness. You should have given it to the poor. And it says, you didn't even care about the poor. And what he is essentially saying, what Judas is essentially saying in what Mary is doing and why he's upset is, Jesus, you are not worth it. You are not worth it. And if we're honest with ourselves, even as believers, we could be saying the exact same thing. In our obedience, in our worship, in our idolatry, in our behavior, in the way in which we serve other people, you are not worth it, Jesus. Maybe that's some of us, especially my heart. And actually in Matthew, it says that the disciples were influenced by Judas, and they chime in, and so they are just scolding her and berating her, and get up, this is crazy. Look what Jesus says in verse 7. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. He doesn't rebuke her for breaking societal norms. He doesn't, he doesn't rebuke her for breaking cultural norms. He doesn't rebuke her for wasting perfume. But instead, he rebukes Judas and the disciples, leave her alone. What she is doing right here is beautiful. It's right. It's excellent. It's appropriate. You think she's inappropriate. I think she's absolutely appropriate. You shouldn't be berating her. You should be joining her, is what he tells them. Why? He says, it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. In Matthew 26, 12, Jesus says, she was doing this to prepare me for burial. And why was it noteworthy what she was doing? Was because Mary, out of everyone in the room, disciples included, she was the only one who got it. She was the only one who understood what was going on. As mentioned back then, you would use this kind of perfume for funerals. You, you would use it to, to cover the smell of a decaying body. And what Jesus is doing here is in his infinite mind, he's taking what Mary's doing right there and in his infinite mind looking six days later and saying, this is for my funeral. She will not get another chance to do this. All next week, it's all treachery. It's all tragedy. You will not get another chance to do this. I am going to the cross soon, and what she's able to do is do this while I'm still alive. She's preparing me for my funeral, and she gets it, and I may not get another chance. Now, we don't know exactly what Mary understood. We don't know if she was able to exactly connect all the dots here, but she does know that Jesus said over and over and over again that I'm going to die. And I'm going to raise again from the grave three days later. And the disciples, they kind of got it, but they didn't really. I, I can't imagine my Messiah dying. And Mary at, the, at least understood Jesus is going to go into Jerusalem next week. And something bad is probably going to happen to him. Probably get arrested, maybe get beaten. Worst case, he's going to die. And I don't know what they're going to do with his body after. Maybe they're going to throw it to the dogs. So I am going to take the opportunity right now to, to give him the proper attention that he needs. I don't care what people think. I don't care what everyone in this room thinks. I know what you're worth, Jesus. I know your value. And I know that anything I own and anything that I am is lower than that. And I'm giving you everything. And that is what worship looks like. Is that what worship looks like? to you. I know what you're worth, Jesus. What perfume? This perfume's nothing compared to you. She was the only one who got it, disciples included. And we know from the rest of the Gospels, Pastor Tian covered this uh, a couple weeks ago, after Jesus dies, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea are going to race against the clock. They need to get him in the grave before the Sabbath on Friday, where they can't touch him. 
So they work against the clock, and they put him in the closest tomb they could find. And we know that on Sunday, we know from the Gospels, the women go to the tomb early, it says, to, pre to finish preparing the body for burial. But by then, he's already risen from the grave. So there, Mary got it. There wasn't going to be another chance to give him the love and attention that he needed. And so what Jesus is doing is saying, what she is doing right here is that. And she gets it. You guys don't have a clue what's going on. She does. Go to a funeral. You look at the flowers. You look at the casket. You look at the decorations. Never in a thousand years, I hope, would you look at those things and say, those are some expensive flowers up there. That, that coffin, they could have gone a little cheaper on the wood. That would have been, you know, we could have given that money to missionaries. Never in a thousand years, I don't think. Why? Because you're honoring the person there. You would never get up and say that. And Jesus is saying, you don't get it. That's what she's doing here, and that's what you guys are doing. That's what you're doing. And Jesus adds in Matthew 26, 13, Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Leave her alone. She is giving her best, and that is the purest example of worship, and you will be talking about her until the end of time. Even in a small church in Gardena in 2023, saying, church, look at Mary that's what worship looks like. Don't be like Judas and the disciples and berate her for that. Look at it and learn from her. That is what worship looks like. Jesus closes and he says this, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Now that, that might seem bad at first. At first blush, that's a, that's a cold, uncaring statement. Jesus is not discounting the poor, okay? We need to understand that. He, he's not saying, I don't care about the poor. In fact, all throughout the Gospels and into the New Testament, it says, you need to take care of the poor. And he says, actually, you taking care of the poor is evidence that you are a true believer. But what he's talking about here is in terms of priority in this moment. You have me, what I'm going to do for souls for eternity, that's more important than feeding mouths right now physically. That's what he's saying. Both are important, but there's a priority here. That's what he's saying. Worshiping the Savior who will wipe away your sins is more important in this moment than what that will lead you to do. Both are important in that order. It takes priority. Palm Sunday, one week before we commemorate the death and resurrection of Jesus. What is the posture of our hearts this morning? We fit into two categories. Whether you believe it or not, whether you realize it or not, the posture of our hearts fits into two categories. You have Judas who gives up Jesus for money or Mary who gives up money for Jesus. Which one are we? Or are we ones who, who look at Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross and see his value and say, everything that I have, everything that I am, my possessions, my house, my car, my wallet, my bank account, my retirement fund, my security, my job, my family, my kids, my health, my relationships, or everything that I am, my gifts, my talents that I take pride in, my influence, my worth, I put that at your feet in Gardena Valley Baptist Church 2023. Is that us? And we know that's true because in Revelation 4, at the end of time, it says we're going to be taking our crowns in eternity and throwing it at the feet of Jesus. Everything that we have that's worth anything is lower than Jesus. Do you believe that? That is worship in its rawest form. And the question for us this morning is, what are you pouring out? Because the idea is you can't love Jesus too much. It's impossible. That's what he's saying. What are you pouring out? Or maybe the better question is, what are you not pouring out? Because Jesus is not worth it. That's a more humbling question. He's worth it. Next October, pastoral appreciation. Imagine they call up Brad Toy to the stage, director of college and young adults, 
and they say, Brad, here you go, $50,000 watch. Yeah, you guys would, <gasps> that's my offering. And I say, hey, don't, no, 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 don't worry. I'm worth it. Yeah, you guys all that. You, that, that would be disgusting, and rightly so. That would be completely disgusting, because you're not worth that. You can never do that with Jesus. You can never say and give him something and go, he's not worth that. That's the idea. Imagine right now, we were up on, on these screens, everyone here by name, we showed your name and we showed every single sin that you did from the moment you were born until this day. In behavior or in the quietness of your heart. If you're anything like me, I wouldn't even look at the screen. I'd put my head down and I would cringe. All that filth and darkness and sin, I, I wouldn't even look at it. I couldn't even bear to look at my name with those things. I'd, but imagine those things grabbing Jesus by the collar, slamming him up against the cross and nailing him to it and being put on him and him being punished as if he did those things, things you wouldn't even look at. And him being treated as if he did those things just so he can have a relationship with you by grace through faith, that's extravagant love at its finest. How are we to respond with extravagant love back? That is normal worship, folks. That's, that's normal worship. That should be the posture of our hearts every Sunday morning. Every moment we wake up, that should be the posture of our hearts. That's normal, what Mary is doing. And she's the example of worship in its purest form. That is the posture of our hearts as we go into Holy Week, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. In our passage after this in John chapter 12, Jesus will wake up the next morning, Sunday morning. You all know the story. It will be Palm Sunday. He will wake up in Bethany, cross the Kidron Valley, go up to Jerusalem, command his disciples to go get the colt of a donkey, and he will march into Jerusalem under the cheers of thousands of people, Hosanna. But by Friday, they will be calling for his head. That is where we are in the story on Palm Sunday. Father, we thank you again for this time. Help us to have a good reflection on the way in which we worship you. And oftentimes when it comes down to it, my heart first is the question, Jesus, are you worth it? And we look at the example of Mary and we look at the example of Judas and our hearts could go either way. And even in our lives as believers, we make that decision every day. Allow us to, in this holy week coming up, for us as believers, as we look back to the cross, allow that to be the posture of our hearts, to be willing to pour out all that we are and all that we have at the feet of Jesus because he's worthy. To look at his extravagant love and for us to extravagantly love him in return with all that we have and all that we are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On this day we call Palm Sunday, we revere Christ and recount his salvation that paved the way. For sinners to have a hope in him, to know that he is the Messiah, the Savior from sin. At this time, a large crowd with palm branches gathered about. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel, the crowd cried out. He came through the streets on a donkey's colt he rode. The king of Israel, in humility he was clothed. Those who gathered thought the Son of God would take the throne of Rome and set them free. But little did they know that the cost of their eternal salvation would come at a fee. This was the week before Christ's death on the cross. However, not all of the crowd realized this true reality and were at a loss. The poignant reality of Christ flew past the crowd's eyes. The Pharisees even counted such praises as lies. The disciples could not fathom 
all of these ties. But the fact of the matter is that in this story, Christ always dies. Yes, Palm Sunday was a day where people show their reverence to the Lord. But let us never forget the reality that salvation came at a cost that can never be ignored. For it is not just Christ's significance of being raised and to raise the dead, but the full gospel and knowledge of who God is instead. Sure, the sight of miracles and signs may compel us to know Christ more, but may we seek Christ in his entirety, which is the core. This is how we can show and give our praise to the Lord, for the reality of the whole gospel was something we could never afford. So on this Palm Sunday, may we revere Christ, know of his extravagant love as the sovereign king. For not only is he the king of Israel, but he is sovereign over everything. Although our relationship with the Lord may seem different than other relationships with other people, I believe that they are similar. I show my love for people by maintaining good communication, doing acts of kindness for them, and listening. I love and care for these people and often are willing to sacrifice for them. I do these things as an outpouring of love for people and want to do the same for the Lord. One way that I show love to God is through prayer. Being in prayer with him gives me the chance to communicate with someone that I care about who also keep, cares deeply for me. I found so much peace in being able to come to the Lord in prayer. For me, there's something so beautiful and reassuring to know that whatever it is that I pray about, it does not fall on deaf ears. About two years ago, I was in the midst of my senior year in high school. I had said throughout my final year that I didn't care where I was going for college. I was going to El Camino anyways. When acceptance letters started rolling in, I found myself being envious toward to those who committed to going to a four year. I was scared ashamed and unsure what the future was going to look like. During that stretch of time, I had talks with many school friends about being insecure about the future, and, well, to my surprise, many of my concerns had fallen on deaf ears. These friends, whom I had spent many years fostering a relationship with, had shown no concern for me in a time of weakness and vulnerability. In that low moment, I was reminded of one who always listens and cares for me. The prayer and talking to him about my insecurities about the future Friends that I thought were going to be there for me and what I would do in the near future were all brought before the Lord. I did not receive a straight answer, but felt at peace, knowing that no matter how turbulent life is, he is one that I can turn to with confidence and know that things will be okay. In response to the love that I experienced from God in prayer, I've started to express my love for him through thanksgiving. He has been good all my life. God is good. There are so many moments where the Lord has been working and I had not known. More often than I would like to admit, I would chalk up things working out to just happenstance or being fortunate. But in all, he is in control. I was unsure about what my future would hold in regards to college, career, and major, and he provided me a place, funnily enough, El Camino, where I'm able to test, see, and discover what he would want me to do. I am reminded of the Lord's faithfulness and goodness, and I am thankful for all that he has done and will do. His faithfulness and love makes it easier to do the same towards others. And when I've experienced these blessings, and even though it's a small thing, I've begun to naturally turn to the Lord and thank him in prayer. Because of the love that he has first shown us on the cross, we are able to and given the privilege to not only enter a relationship with the Holy God, but also worship, communicate, and learn more about him. Truly, what a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Good morning, church. We will now be entering into a time of communion together. So can uh, the ushers please come forward and hand out the elements. And when everyone receives the elements, uh, then we will take it together. This is a time for us believers to remember Jesus' blood that he shed for us on the cross. And so when you receive your elements, please take this time to just reflect on what Jesus has done for us and the meaning and significance of this sacrifice.
As we take communion together, I will be reading from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. Please peel back the top layer of your cup to access the bread. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat the bread together. You may now open the cup as well. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for this symbol that you have provided to us, that we can remember your sacrifice and how great it was. Lord, you took all of our sins and nailed them to the cross. You defeated death. Lord, and this is a price we can never pay. This is a debt that we can never we can never pay for ourselves, Lord. And so, God, I just pray, would you help us to fix our eyes on you, to not turn to the things of this world, but, Lord, that we would, we would pour everything out to you because you are worth it. You are worthy of our praise, God, and because you poured out everything for us on the cross. Lord, I just pray that everything that we do would be a pleasing form of worship to you. God, we love you and we thank you. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Alrighty, can we all rise as we enter into this time of worship?
us for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day
this morning would be a good reminder of what Jesus did for us on the cross that so many times we take so lightly in our lives. And I pray that this morning we could look at the Lord's extravagant love towards us and we could respond in a way that is worthy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this time, Lord. We need it, Lord. We, we, we need that reminder to see your worth, Lord sometimes can lose your worth in trying to treasure other things in this world, God. And oftentimes our worship shows it. But Father, we, we thank you that you've given us this time this morning to look at Holy Week, to kick off the week that you went to the cross and to think about the price that you paid for us on the cross. There's, there's so many times in our life where we minimize what you took upon yourself on the cross. But Lord, help us to look at you in your person and to look at your value and to respond in worship, Lord, in all that we have and all that we are. We proclaim that we love you and we worship you. And without your sacrifice, we have nothing. In Jesus' name we pray respond to the Lord with extravagant love.